Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's close our eyes for prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for the worship service. Thank you for our lives. Thank you for the time you've given us. I want to thank you for the privilege of coming on a Sunday like this to give back part of the time which you have given us unto you. We ask, O oh Lord, that our time in your presence will be a memorable, unforgettable time in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that none of us will grudge you for the time we we'll spend in your presence. That as you are willing to bless us and to draw us closer to yourself and connect us with yourself by your word, we pray that none of us will shrink back or assist you in Jesus' name. Speak your word to your children. We're ready. We're willing, we want to hear. And let the word do good in every life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're looking at First Peter chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 14. First Peter chapter 3, verse 14. But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Peter the Apostle, from personal experience, Peter the Apostle, from the teaching of Jesus his Lord and Savior, Jesus are taught about suffering, about persecution. And Peter had had a taste of that. And now writing by the Holy Ghost, he writes to the believers, members of the body of Christ. And he says, but, and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. You are not unfortunate. You are not abandoned it says you're happy that you suffer for righteousness sake now it tells us tells you be not afraid of their terror neither be troubled as we look at the scriptures this morning i'm talking to you on the paradox of becoming stronger through suffering satan would have thought that his suffering will weaken the church. The persecutors will have thought that persecution and suffering will weaken the church. And the Israelites, the Jews, would have thought that the church will not go beyond the borders of Jerusalem and the province of Judea or the community of the Samaritans. They had thought that the gospel will not go beyond to the uttermost part of the earth because of the suffering. It's a paradox, something unexpected. The paradox of becoming stronger through suffering. Actually, as you look at First Peter, you find that in every chapter, it touches on this important subject, chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 6. First Peter chapter 1 verse 6. When ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold trials, temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, 
ye love, in whom though ye now see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. It talks about their trials there, the suffering in chapter 2, reading from verse 19. Chapter 2, verse 19, for this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, for what glory is it? If when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently, but if when ye do well and suffer for it, if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye shall follow his steps. Verse 19 mentions suffering, suffering wrongfully. Verse 20 mentions suffering when you do well and suffer for it. Verse 21 mentions suffering that Christ left us an example, he suffered for us. Chapter 1 talks about suffering. Chapter 2 talks about suffering. Look at chapter 3, verse 17. For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well doing than for evil doing. For Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Again, there he mentions suffering. But that's suffering for Christ, suffering for righteousness. Look at chapter 4, verse 15. In chapter 4, verse 15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer. Suffering will come, but not because of sinning, not because of evil. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet, if any man suffer here is the word again if any man suffer as a christian let him not be ashamed but let him glorify god on this behalf chapter 5 verse 1 the elders which are among you i exhort who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of christ Peter said, as an apostle, I am a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Verse 10, but the God of all grace who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after that ye have suffered a while suffered a while make you perfect establish strengthen and settle you it's a paradox that after the suffering in spite of the suffering despite the suffering because of the suffering we become stronger through that suffering as you have seen this first epistle of peter highlights the suffering of saved, forgiven, regenerated child of God. Satan intends to weaken the sage. Satan intends to destroy the sage. Satan intends to devastate the sage through suffering. The paradox of the Christian life is that suffering makes saints stronger battles make saints brighter and better believers persecution makes pilgrims purer the word of god is very clear 
that instead of oppression, opposition, persecution, suffering, destroying us, destroying a Christian man, a Christian woman, a Christian family, a Christian body, persecution rather makes us stronger. Exodus chapter 1. In Exodus chapter 1, verse 12, but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. The more they oppressed them, persecuted them, and made them to suffer, afflicting them, the more they multiplied and the more they grew. And they were grieved, the Egyptians were grieved because of the children of Israel. You will grow. You will be stronger. Persecution will not destroy you. Persecution will develop you. The paradox of becoming stronger through suffering. Three things we're looking at. Number one, preserving a good conscience while suffering. Preserving a good conscience while suffering. Number two, possessing godly character without secretly sinning. You know, persecution can make some people to compromise, can make them to commit crime, to commit evil. After all, I'm suffering, and since I'm suffering, what's the use of remaining godly, righteous, pure, sanctified? And so they give up. But you are not the kind of person that will give up. Possessing godly character without secretly sinning. Point number three, pursuing a glorious crown. Pursuing a glorious crown with single-minded steadfastness. That even though the suffering is there, you're still committed, you're still faithful, you're still steadfast, and you focus your mind on your goal and you want to win the crown on the final day and so you are pursuing your glorious crown for single-minded steadfastness number one preserving a good conscience while suffering come to first peter chapter 3 in first peter chapter 3 verse 16 having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evil doers they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in christ for it is better if the will of god be so that you suffer for well doing you have the good conscience that you're a child of God. You're following the way of God and you're doing the will of God and you're following the way of righteousness and you keep on doing well rather than doing evil. Verse 18, For Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. That's the purpose. Through our suffering, maintaining a good conscience, we want to bring the onlookers to God. The people that are looking at us at the arena, the arena of suffering and the arena of persecution. And they see that we maintain a good conscience it brings them to God and in the case of Christ that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh and quickened by the spirit the conscience is very important while we're suffering that we have a good conscience we're looking at Romans chapter 2 in Romans chapter 2 verse 15 Romans chapter 2 reading from verse 15 
which show the work of the law reaching in their hearts their conscience also bearing them witness and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing them or else excusing one another when we suffer our conscience will either excuse us or accuse us if we have done wrong if we were not living by the light we have received if our life during the week is different from our teaching the doctrine the understanding on the first day of the week on sunday our conscience will remind us really this suffering is not persecution you cannot classify this as suffering for christ because everything you heard on the first day of the week you negate and you disobey during the week your conscience will accuse you but if you're suffering for righteousness if you're living the life of the christian if your life and your learning if they match if your character and the doctrine match if what you commit yourself to and your character your behavior if they match your conscience will excuse you and say those persecutors have problems those people who are pushing oppressing you they have problem but you are all right i pray you'll be all right Verse 15, which show the work of the law reaching in their hearts. It's even talking about unbelievers. And it says, the law, the word of God is reaching in their heart. How much more the believer, the word of God, the law of God is reaching on the heart of the believer and the believer is supposed to live according to that law that is reaching within him and when he does that his conscience will approve of him his conscience will support him his conscience will say you're doing the right thing hebrews chapter 8 hebrews chapter 8 and i'm reading from verse 10 Hebrews chapter 8 verse 10 for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days says the Lord I will put my laws on into their mind I will put the doctrine in their mind I'll put the teaching in their mind I'll put the standard of the gospel in their mind and write them in their hearts and i will be unto them a god and they shall be unto me a people he writes the law in our heart he writes the word in our heart and as a result of putting it into our hearts if we contradict it if we disobey it, if we negate it, if we live contrary, our conscience will accuse us. And so when we suffer, our conscience will say, don't say you are suffering persecution. Punishment is what you are suffering. You are suffering punishment for the evil sin that you have done, not persecution for righteousness. Hebrews chapter 10 I read from verse 16 Hebrews chapter 10 verse 16 this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days says the Lord I will put my laws into their hearts I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them in their minds will i write those commandments of mine and if god puts his law his commandments in your mind he supervises it 
so that it is not erased and if you are cooperating with God if you are living by the power of the Spirit of God and by the enlightenment of the gospel day by day moment by moment you will be living according to that law that is written in your heart and uh, your conscience will be a witness that you are doing uh, the right thing but for the unbeliever he comes to church he's not born again he comes to church he has not given his life to the lord he comes to church and there is no evidence of the presence of christ in his life his conscience will be defiled titus chapter 1 titus chapter 1 verse 15 unto the pure all things are pure but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving nothing is pure unto the ones that are unbelieving nothing is sacred unto the ones that do not know god the bible is not sacred the name of god to them is not sacred and the sanctuary of god is not sacred and the doctrine of the word is not sacred and the life that is upheld which were to live for them is not sacred nothing is pure nothing is sacred and then it says even their mind and their conscience is defiled they do not know the lord and because or they might profess they know the lord look at verse 16 they profess that they know god but in works in life in character in behavior they deny him being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate so you can tell if somebody doesn't know the lord the life he lives will tell and the character will tell and the conscience might not even be talking to him or challenging him or her anymore because something happened to the conscience we're looking at first timothy chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 first timothy chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 while you are opening that passage i'm going to ask you a question does your conscience ever challenge you does your conscience ever accuse you does your conscience ever alert you does your conscience ever remind you you are a child of god the word of god is written in your heart and your conscience calling you hey you're going across the line you're going over the border you're going beyond that which is reaching does your conscience ever speak to you but you know if you're a real child of God, your conscience will remind you. That's the word of God. Your conscience will remind you. Here is how to live. But if not, First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils when the devil comes he removes sound doctrine he removes the doctrine of righteousness the doctrine of holiness and he implants his own doctrine doctrines of devils that's why you find there are people you expect they're converted People you expect, they are consecrated to the Lord. People you expect that since they have been hearing the word of God, they are saved and sanctified, and the law of God is reaching in their heart, you find them doing the exact opposite. And it says they believe in the doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. In Hebrews chapter 9, that's why you need to take that conscience to the Lord. He will cleanse us. 
I said they will wash us. I said they will purify us. And our conscience will be cleansed from every evil thought, evil action, and doctrines of the devil in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever taken your heart, your mind, your conscience, your soul, your spirit unto God, your inner man unto God? Lord, the inner man needs cleansing, needs purging. And your conscience, you take that to the Lord. Make my conscience sensitive. Make my conscience pure. Make my conscience good so that the life I live will be approved of a good conscience. It says, I'll purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Verse 15. And for this cause, for this reason, for this purpose, he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the false testament they which are called might receive the promise of an eternal inheritance chapter 10 chapter 10 of hebrews verse 19 having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. You see, when your conscience is purged, when your conscience is purified, and when your life aligns, agrees with the word of God, you have boldness to pray. You have confidence to pray. You have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus by new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience having our hearts sprinkled cleansed washed from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water and when that happens you have the grace and you have the enablement to live with good conscience before god and before man in acts chapter 24 acts chapter 24 I'm reading here from verse 16. Herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Herein, since I knew the Lord, herein, in this way, in this understanding, I exercise myself. You understand exercise? Like you are running, exercise. Like you are jogging, exercise. Like you are swimming, exercise. Like you are on a treadmill and you are moving as if you are walking some distance, exercise. You are punching bags, exercise, so that your blood in your veins will run well. Everything will be alright. I'll be sound and healthy. But you know sometimes something about exercise. Look at that verse 16 again. And herein do I exercise myself. Nobody can do exercise for you. You have to do the exercise by yourself. When you become born again, you become a child of God. Herein do I exercise myself 
to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Nobody will do it for you. You have to maintain that good conscience every time by yourself, by yourself, as nobody can breathe for you on your behalf, and nobody can eat on your behalf, nobody can exercise on your behalf, you have to do the a restitution and exercise a good conscience by yourself. The teacher can teach you, the pastor can preach to you. I remember when I was born again, 1964, the 5th of April, the preachers preached, the teachers taught, but they didn't know what I'd done, that I'd taken library books from my school, in the secondary school, never returned them. I had to exercise myself. I did it myself. I went to a principal, even though he didn't believe in God or believe in the Bible, but I believe in the Bible. And I made the restitution. I exercised myself in a good conscience. And then I got to university. And it didn't dawn on me before that I needed to exercise myself in this. You see, I was good, very good in maths. And so I thought I was, uh, you know, being generous. And I took uh, the WIAC exam for uh, some of my friends. I did it the first year, and the fellow got a good grade. I did it and for another person the following year. I was already doing my A-level, and they were doing O-level. Then it dawned on me. I exercised myself. You see, that's very important that you'll exercise yourself and I wrote to work I said this is what I did this is what I did and I wrote to my friends I didn't do no anonymous restitution I wrote to my friends I said that exam I took for you is wrong and I'm reaching to work and they may contact you and if they contact you, understand, it's me that reported the matter. I exercise myself. You see, there are people, they do not understand. You need to have a clear conscience, a good conscience, clear and clean before God and man. I'm sure some of you know the story. Um, I was in another church when deep and life began. And as deep and light began, it was a ministry. I didn't intend there will be any church service. It will kind of grow to a church. I felt it will be a ministry. Teach the word of God. Teach the word of God to people. And the church I was going then didn't appreciate that. And so they called me and said, look, this thing you're doing is going to earn you uh, something you will not enjoy. And I asked my overseer then, Pastor, I said, what's going to happen? Tell me. He said, we are going to send you out of the church. I said, why? He said, because you're doing something we don't approve. You don't approve believing the Bible, teaching the Bible, instructing others about the Bible. He said, no argument. Don't come and preach to us here. We don't accept what you're doing. And so they excommunicated me. 1977 and then I continue the Bible study you will continue I said you will continue what I want to tell you is this somebody saw me in America went for a conference and um, his overseer of another church and he called me and I, I went to him he said I had a church such and such that church and he lambasted that church and he abused that church insulted that church and said I learned that uh, the decks communicated you and they sent you away that is wrong I said hold on they were right they called me they warned me and they told me that what I was doing was not in line with their church policy yeah, right evangelism was not in their church policy 
teaching Bible study in your home, house fellowship, that was not in their policy. They told me. And then they told me if I didn't stop, this is what they will do. And so when I didn't stop, they handled me in their own understanding as a disobedient member. And they told me, you are not a good member. And that's right. I wasn't a good member there. That's why they sent me out. And I didn't want to be a good member there because I was convinced in what I was doing. That man, the overseer of another church, looked at me and said, you're a real child of God. I thought you will run down that church. I thought you will blame them. I said, no, I'm the one to blame. I didn't obey them. And if everybody did what I did and there's no obedience in the church, they told me the church will scatter. And they didn't want their church to scatter. That's why they sent me away. You see, you must carry your good conscience everywhere. And even when what you are saying will be against you, you will tell the truth. Look at that verse 16 again. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. You will do it. You'll have a good conscience in Jesus' name. In First Timothy chapter 1 verse 5. First Timothy chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Good conscience. Point number two, possessing godly character without secretly sinning. Possessing godly character without secretly sinning. In First Peter chapter 4, reading from verse 1. First Peter chapter 4, verse 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself, equip yourself, fortify yourself, strengthen yourself likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sinning, that he no longer should live the rest of his life in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, past tense, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatry, wherein they think it strange that she run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. It tells us there, we've suffered in the flesh, we've suffered persecution, why are we suffering? For righteousness. And if you have suffered for righteousness, you want to make sure you don't continue in sin. Deuteronomy chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 13, reading from verse 6. In verse 6, it says, If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, entice thee secretly, 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 saying, 
let us go and serve other gods which thou hast not known thou nor thy fathers namely the gods of the people which are round about you nice unto thee or far off from thee from uh, the one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth thou shalt not consent unto him they entice you secretly and they lure you secretly and they say let's do this let's do this and you know that's sinful that would be a transgression that's contrary to the word of God and the person is asking you to do this is uh, very close to you like a relative a wife a husband a son a daughter a brother somebody that's as close to you as your very heart and he's saying it secretly you say no i cannot i'm born again my conscience will not allow that you maintain a good conscience and godly character second kings chapter 17 second kings chapter 17 we're reading from verse 9 second kings chapter 17 verse 9 and the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God. The laws of God were no more secret in their sight. The name of God was no more secret unto them. The commandments of God were no more secret unto them. And they did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God and he built them high places in all their cities from the tower of the watchmen to the first cities look at verse 25 in verse 25 and so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not the Lord when you do secretly things that are not right in the sight of God and you forget that God's eyes can see what you are doing his ears can hear what you are saying but you live as if there were no God you are a practical atheist you don't believe in the existence of God you don't believe in the uh, omnipotence omnipresence of God a practical atheist it says at the beginning of their dwelling there they feared not the lord therefore the lord sent lions among them which slew some of them of course they thought they thought they were serving god look at verse 34 in verse 34 unto this day they do after their former manners they fear not the Lord. They fear not the Lord. Look at verse 40. How be it? They did not hack him, but they did after their former manner. If you're still behaving like your former character, although you might say you are saved, that salvation doesn't have any record in heaven you say you are converted that conversion doesn't have any record in heaven you say you are a member of a bible believing church that membership does not have any record in heaven how be it they did not hack him but they did after their former manners so these nations feared the lord and served their graven images what they think uh, fearing the lord is when there's thunder they say oh god when you get into a gallop of a vehicle moving oh god when there is a rain that removes the roof of a building and they say, they say oh god because of that they think they fear god but not really they don't fear god they serve their own graven images both their children and their children's children as did their fathers so do they 
unto this day. It's godly character, free from secret sinning, that marks us out as children of God. Psalm 19. In Psalm 19, reading from verse 12. Psalm 19, I'm reading from verse 12. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Those are the people that have the mind of serving God. They're not just religious, they're righteous. And they say, Lord, I belong to you. I'm saved. I'm forgiven. My life is turned around. And help me and grant me your grace that I'll not do any secret sin, sinning against you. Psalm 44, I read from verse 20. Psalm 44, reading from verse 20. If we have forgotten the name of our God or stretched out our hands, to a strange God, shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. He knoweth the secrets of the heart. If we say we're serving God, what we think of in the private, what we do in secret, he knows that. If we're going to be real people of God, we possess godly character without secretly sinning against God. Shall not God search this out? For he knows the secrets of the heart. Proverbs chapter 9. In Proverbs chapter 9, reading from verse 17. Proverbs chapter 9. Verse 17. In verse 17, stolen waters are sweet, and bread eating in secret is pleasant to the unbeliever, to the sinner, to the criminal. What he steals appears sweet, and the bread he eats in secret. Nobody will see this, nobody will know this. It appears pleasant. But he knows not that the dead are there. He knows not that God is taking note of all those evil things and sinful things he does in secret. And God classifies that secret sinner with those who are going to perish. I pray your life will not be dirty in the secret in Jesus' name. But he knows not, he knows not, he knows not that the dead are there and that are guests, the guests of the prostitute, the guests of the harlots, the guests of licentious women, her guests are in the depths of hell. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment secret sinners don't believe that the church goers they come to our church they know the bible they might even quote bible to us they might say i'm even a worker house fellowship leader unfortunately some might say i'm a preacher i'm a minister i'm a location pastor but they do not believe that God will bring every work to judgment. They act anyhow. If the GS or the senior pastor in the church will not see them, that's okay for them. Once the GS will not discover 
I'm the one that initiated that. I'm the one that did that. They do it without even checking themselves. They don't have conscience. They might be churchgoers or churchcomers. They do not believe that every work will come to judgment. It says in verse 14, For God shall bring every work into judgment and every secret sin. And every secret sin. And every secret sin. You're discussing together. A fellow child of God, believer, just walks in unintentionally. And then you signal to each other, you keep quiet. That's secret. What are you hiding? You are in a section of the church and you're leading the people. And you're always telling them, always telling them, everything we do here, let us stop here. Everything we say here, they must not hear it outside that wall. Everything we say here, nobody must be going about telling stories. They told us this, they told us, they said this. Is that a secret cult? What are you doing that should not see the light of day? What are you checking up as you come back, you know, to your meeting? Your one, before you start your training section, you're asking them, did you say anything to anybody outside this, our cult, outside this, our secret group, secret society within the church? He doesn't believe in God. He's just doing religion. And he's saying, if we know, there's anybody here that will tell what we're saying, what we're planning, we close our doors. If you are the person, we'll send you away. And those people fear those secret sinners more than they fear God. They're no more Christians. For God shall bring every walk into judgment with every secret sin, whether it be good or whether it be evil you will not be a secret sinner you will not support a secret leader don't tell you know the gs it doesn't appreciate this it carries holiness to all the various areas if he hears this and you know it doesn't uh, you know think of the personality of anybody if this happens and he hears and he takes any action, then you are the one that got me into trouble. And because of that, there's a secret cult in that corner. There's a secret society in that corner. There's a secret assembly in that corner. There's a secret person in that corner. It's no more a church if it's like that. Our church will not be a secret cult. Our church will not be a place where criminals and sinners will come to hide. No sinner, no criminal will hide inside our church in Jesus' name. It's uncompleted building where criminals hide. And then you can't get at them. Is this an uncompleted church? Uncompleted building? Are oh, you not seeing a secret sinner, a secret killer? Are oh, you hiding them there? Let everything come to the open. And let's know that you are a Christian, you're a real child of God. I pray God will help you in Jesus' name. When you hear the word of God from the pulpit here, or you hear that the pastor said, this is what to do. That's what we all do. It's a church. Is this a church? What's the name of the church? Make it deeper now. Not make it shallow. Shout deeper. Deeper life Bible church. If you hear that this is what we're doing and this is what we intend and somebody calls you in the secret. What did the pastor tell you to do? He told me to do this, this, and this. And secretly, that person will tell you, 
don't do that do it this way do it this way if you do that the person who told you is a secret sinner and you carrying that out a secret sinner if your conscience doesn't tell you that your conscience is seared with a hot iron if Christ comes while you're doing that you will not make it to heaven and I'm not preaching in vain that you know I'll teach and teach and teach and then secretly the secret influences the people are not able to make it to heaven I pray you'll make it to heaven you know I'm so sure that if you listen to everything that comes from this pulpit and you don't listen to any other secret thing and you walk by the word I'm so sure you will get to heaven you know about myself I don't have any secret everywhere I go the convoy of those cars and the security people and the brethren they follow me I don't have any secret place to go, any secret friend to have, any secret thing to do. And when they follow me like that, I don't say, you're too near. Come on, go aside. I need some freedom. I want to do, I want to go and do something that I don't want anybody to know so they don't report to my wife. Nothing like that. Aren't you, aren't you happy you have a pastor like that? Everything is open. I just told you now the restitution I made when I was a younger Christian. I don't hide anything. I just told you now what happened in the church I was going and what they told me they would do and what they did. I don't have any secret. And if you can live like that and open your life and live a life that is transparent, I'm sure heaven will be waiting for you. Jeremiah chapter 23. I'm reading from verse 24. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 24. Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? Says the Lord. Do not I feel heaven and earth? Says the Lord. He knows everything. I said, He knows everything. We're reading from Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 11. Ephesians chapter 5. Reading from verse 11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it's a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret it's a shame even to talk about what is happening to them what what they're doing in secret that will be no more in our lives first corinthians chapter 15 first corinthians chapter 15 verse 33 be not deceived evil communications corrupt good manners Awake to righteousness and sin not. Amen. Amen. Awake to righteousness and sin not. Can you read that with me? Say that again. When somebody comes to tell you something in secret, do it this way, do it that way, and you know that that's not righteousness. Be bold enough, have enough backbone to look at the person eyeball to eyeball and say, hey, awake to righteousness and sin not. That's not what, what we're taught. We're taught the word of God clearly and plainly and transparently in the church. And I've decided I'm going to live a righteous life. Have you decided? I said, have you decided? Awake to righteousness and sin not. Point number three, pursuing a glorious crown of single-minded steadfastness. 
we're coming back to first peter chapter 4 first peter chapter 4 i read from verse 14 first peter chapter 4 verse 14 if ye be reproached for the name of christ happy are ye are you happy i said are you happy if ye be reproached for the name of christ tell me happy i am for the spirit of glory and of god rests upon you on their part he is evil spoken of but on your part is glorified but let none of you suffer as a murderer in our church let none of you suffer as a murderer in our church let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evil doer or as a busybody in other men's matters give me a good amen over there murderer is a murderer a real member of our church i said somebody is a murderer is he a true member of our church is he a robber a burglar is he a true member of our church an evil doer is he a member of deeper life a busy body in other men's matters is he a member of our church no look up here if somebody is a murderer if somebody is an evil doer if somebody is an adulterer going to other people's wives and then a journalist comes across that person murderer and they want to write about it in the newspapers and the man is saying i'm deeper life i'm deeper life and you then rush there and say journalist please don't write about him he is a member of our church let us settle him you don't understand who is a member of the church is a murderer a member of your church no if you church people will hide all the murderers all the thieves all the rogues because they profess they are members of deeper life and you are pleading with policemen you are pleading with um, you know all the people that will expose him because he will mention deeper life as his church and you are protecting the name of the church and therefore you are hiding a murderer god will judge you that you support evil because you are protecting churchianity and you are not protecting the word of god if they catch any murderer and you know about it leave him in the hands of the law enforcement agents don't bail him out don't protect him don't allow him to run away look at that verse 15 again but let none of you suffer as a murderer give me a good amen, amen. or as a thief another amen, amen. or as an evil doer give me a good amen, amen. or as a busy body in other men's matters yet if any man suffer as a christian that's the only suffering acceptable if you're righteous and you're being persecuted you're christ-like and you're being persecuted you're straightforward and you're being persecuted you're preaching sound doctrine and you're being persecuted like i did in my own church old church and i preached the word from cover to cover and they said they didn't want this aspect evangelism or that aspect or that aspect and i suffered for that that's praiseworthy i pray like father like children 
like father, like sons, like father, like daughters in Jesus' name. If any man suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let him that suffer according to the will of God. Let him that suffer according to the will of God. Let him that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Amen. Amen. Look at Second Peter chapter 3 verse 17. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 17. Ye therefore, beloved, seen ye know these things before beware lest ye also be led away with the error of the wicked led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness you will not fall first corinthians chapter 9 i read from verse 24 first corinthians chapter 9 I'm reading from verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that she may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery, don't strive for mediocrity, strive for maturity. Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now the duty to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep my body under. Do you keep your body under? I'm asking the question, do you keep your body under? Read it then, verse 27, but I keep my body under. Read it. I keep my eyes under. I keep my tongue under. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. You will not be a castaway. You will stand by the word of God. In 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, I read from verse 11. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. You will not suffer in vain. Your persecution will not be in vain. Your suffering will not be in vain. You will reign with Christ. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, tell me, he also will deny us. There are some people that think they are eternally secured. Whatever they do, however they live, they're saved, they're saved, forever and forever, whatever they do. There's some people, they think, because they're ministers, because they're preachers, because they're leaders, they're forever secured. They forget Eli, and they forget Aaron, and they forget Judas Iscariot, 
They say, whatever I do as a leader, nobody can touch me. That's not true. There's leadership in our church. Whatever your position or title, if you do anything wrong, and we know, if we don't know, we don't know. If we know, we'll call you back to the scriptures. Them that sin, rebuke openly that others may fear. And when leadership begins to fear and it cannot correct things in the church, the church is gone. Our church is standing. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abides faithful. He cannot deny himself. I will not deny him. You are not saying it well. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 12. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learnt and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learnt them. Continue, I will continue. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 6. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6. But Christ, as his son, over his own house, whose house are we? Whose house we are? If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Verse 14. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. You will hold on unto the end. You will not fall by the wayside. In First Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5 verse 8 be sober be vigilant because your adversary the devil as a running lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour he will not eat you up whom resist steadfast in the faith resist steadfast in the faith how are you going to resist Satan? You start in a small way. When somebody, ordinary person, ordinary backslider, who is not clothing you, who is not feeding you, who is not sheltering you, when somebody who means nothing to you, when he tells you to do something evil, and you cannot resist him and you are not getting anything from him it's only his shouting or his bullying that's all you get if you cannot resist him are you going to resist your manager who tells you to do evil in your place of work your director who tells you to do evil in your place of work the landlord who calls you to do evil in your house where you're living you start with the small, inconsequential messenger of Satan that tells you to do evil. You say, no, you resist him. Another person higher than him comes and he tells you to do evil from your experience and strength in saying no to that other one who is a nobody. You're able to say no to this higher person. And another person, the higher one comes, you're able to say no. Because practice makes perfection. You have been practicing. No, 
no no i cannot do that when satan comes as a running lion you'll be able to say no do you remember wherever you go whatever you do do not say yes when you ought to say no don't just crumble like that and then you cannot stand and all the teaching of holiness is run down the drain you will stand look at verse 9 whom receives steadfast in the faith knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world we're looking at job chapter 27 job chapter 27 i'm reading from verse 6 job chapter 27 verse 6 my righteousness i hold fast amen my righteousness i hold fast can you say that look up here what it means is this you have righteousness because you are born again you have position because you are in our church you have ministry you have house you have car you have money you have job you have many other things if any of those things will cause you to lose righteousness you say no every other thing can go but my righteousness tell me out aloud i hold fast and will not let it go my heart shall not reproach me so long as i live that's how to keep the crown pursuing a glorious crown with single-minded steadfastness second timothy chapter one second timothy chapter one i read from verse 13 in second timothy chapter 1 verse 13 hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in christ jesus that good sin do you have any good sin i said do you have any good sin what do you have salvation i said what do you have what do you have holiness do you have holiness sound doctrine do you have sound doctrine and then a crown is waiting for you are you going to miss your crown that good sin which was committed unto thee keep by the holy ghost which dwells in us revelation chapter 2 revelation chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 25 revelation chapter 2 verse 25 it says in verse 25 but that which ye have already hold fast till i come and he that overcometh and keep it my works unto the end to him i will give power over the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers even as i received of my father and i will give him the morning star he that has an ear let him hear what the spirit says unto the churches is the lord speaking to you this morning are you hearing are you going to obey revelation chapter 3 verse 11 revelation chapter 3 verse 11 behold i come quickly hold that fast that thou hast that no man take thy crown behold i come quickly do you believe in the imminent coming of christ hold 
that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. No man will take my crown. No man will deprive me of my rewards. No man will take holiness from me. No man will take heaven from me. Rise up and make your commitment unto the Lord. Tell him, tell him, tell him that no man will take your conviction away. No man will take your obedience away. No man will take your crown away. No man will take the doctrine that you have and the character of Christ that you have. No man will take that away from you. A good conscience, a godly character, a glorious crown.